Thank you for joining me again. If you have a Bible, turn with me to Daniel chapter 5. We're going to begin the story of King Belshazzar. We'll have to complete it tomorrow morning because it's a long story. But King Belshazzar took over the kingdom from Nebuchadnezzar. And he gave a great banquet for thousands of his nobles and drank wine with them. Well, that was one thing. But verse 2 tells me, while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Do you hear that? So, what happened then? His kings, his nobles, his wives, his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem. And the king, his nobles, his wives, his concubines drank from them. Now, if you remember the Old Testament story, these were things that had been consecrated to the Lord our God. And sometimes when we step in and we desecrate what God has consecrated, we are in awful trouble. And Belshazzar was in awful trouble that night. You don't play games with God like that. And there are times when you play games with God and there are times when I play games with God. And friend, if we do, be careful. Now notice verse 4. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood and stone. They were praising idolatrous gods using the things that belong to the God of heaven. That is terrible blasphemy and sacrilege and our God stepped into this situation. But just a minute. Let's bring this down to very everyday terms. Let's start with your body and mine. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian believer, as you're listening to me, you are consecrated to God. Do you ever use your body and desecrate it in some way? Maybe with an addiction, even sometimes with immorality? Friend, when we do that, we do what King Belshazzar did in a different form. And you see, it's interesting. We can read a story like this and be horrified at the actions of the king. And yet, within our own lives, we can do the same things in totally different ways. The Lord our God has given us minds. How do we use them? Do we use them to glorify him? Or do we pollute them with the things of the world? You see, the sacrilegious things that even a Christian can do. And it's very easy to let the world just push in and lose that holy, purified life. And then suddenly, verse 5, listen, if you've got any imagination. You see, what I find is this. When we read the Bible, we become all churchy. And when we become churchy, we miss the impact. We don't get excited about it. There's no imagination there. If we're watching television, our favorite program, maybe you're a dynasty fiend and you're just watching this and you're living every moment of it. And then you come to the Bible and you, nom, 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 and you just read it. But listen to these two verses, five and six. They're marvelous, magnificent. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale. He was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. Do you understand that? Here he is looking at the wall and suddenly from nowhere a man's hand comes and starts writing on the wall right by the lampstand. Isn't that like our God? He wrote where Belshazzar would see it and be able to see it very clearly. But the reaction of the king... As he watched the hand, his face turned pale. He was so frightened that his knees knocked together. His legs gave way. What is going on? Now this is our God. He's stepping into that situation. Now our God gives us warnings. And he does it in all sorts of different ways. Uh, but not always like this. This again is dramatic. Just as with King Nebuchadnezzar, he had to go through a situation that I trust none of us would ever have to go through. But God was trying to get his attention. Now God is trying to get King Belshazzar's attention. And he did. So, the king went to the enchanters. Listen to verse 7. 
the king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to these wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads the writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he'll be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. Do you understand it? Can you see it happening? Can you see this king? He's drinking it up. He's having a great evening. I mean, this is a party of parties. The place is swinging until God steps in. And that man's hand that wrote just shook Belshazzar to his foundations. His face grew pale. His knees knocked. He was scared stiff. What's happening? Then verse 10. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet. Now isn't that interesting? She wasn't even allowed in. O oh, king, live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There's a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, I say, appointed him chief of the magicians, chanters, astrologers, diviners. This man, Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, has found to have been keen in mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, solve problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. King Belshazzar's queen knew what was going on. King Belshazzar hadn't got the big picture. Wherever she had been, she knew what was going on in King Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And notice the way they looked at Daniel. They felt that it was something like the enchanters and the magicians and the diviners. You and I know it was the mighty power of our God. It was the work of the Holy Spirit in Daniel. They couldn't understand that. They couldn't get hold of the picture. But they knew there was a spirit in this man that was beyond the spirit in anybody else. And that's always true of a man who has the Holy Spirit. But things began to change then. Verse 13. So Daniel was brought in before the king. And the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles, my father, the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you. You have insight, intelligence, outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means. But they could not explain it. Now I've heard that you're able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing, tell me what it means. You will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you'll be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. I love the way Daniel responds to this. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. So here's Daniel. He doesn't want rewards, but he will read it for him. And straight away, Belshazzar can't wait to hear the interpretation. But you see, all the time in the book of Daniel, two things happen. First of all, if you read from chapter 1, as we have done, just selected readings, you will find Daniel was a man of prayer. Daniel was a man who communed with his God. And because of this, when the chips were down, when the crisis came, Daniel was always on target. What a lesson for you and me. We don't prepare ourselves, and when the chips are down, we don't know how to handle it. That's why we get into such difficulties. Here was a man who understood. Here was a man who kept close to his God. And here was a man who was dealing with kings who had such power, but he was always spot on because he was always in communication with his God. Now, I don't care what job you have. None of you listening to my voice have a greater task than Daniel had. But do you keep this same communion with God? Do you keep in touch with him? Are you able at any time just to turn to him and get an interpretation to the particular problem that's come down the pike today? Do you know what God is saying? 
It is the man who spends time communing with our Lord is the one who has the answers because our God gives divine wisdom to the man who's close to him. Just as he gave divine wisdom to Daniel in each situation of his life, dealing with these different kings, and he did have some different kings. He started with Nebuchadnezzar, he went on to Belshazzar, next he deals with Darius, and all the time, Daniel is always spot on. Interesting fact, as you read this book, and as you study this character Daniel, not once do you find anything that this book says against Daniel. This man is incredible. And there are very few men in the scripture where nothing is said against them. He had a holy life in an unholy situation. He had a holy life in an occult situation. Daniel is an incredible man. He's not going to take the king's gifts, but he will give the interpretation. So notice in verse 18 he says, O king, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty, greatness, and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language dreaded and feared him. So this is a picture, you see. He's straight away taking him back to the most high God. I don't know if you can see Belshazzar's face, but I hope you can. It's still pale. Now he's listening. Daniel has his full attention. He's not about to miss a word. He wants to know what's going on. He can still see in his mind's eye that hand. And there on the wall in front of him, that writing is still looking at him. He's given up drinking. He's not looking at his food. He is fully concentrated on what our God has said. Are you? As you're going into work this morning, have you had time to read the word? Oh no, you say, Richard, I'm far too busy, friend. None of us can be too busy. We need to learn from Daniel. Well, you say he had the time. I'm not sure about that. I think he made the time. If you were in the position Daniel held in those kingdoms, he was a pretty busy man. But he always had time for his God. So in the crisis of life, he was always on. Are you? Or is it in a crisis of life, this goes wrong, that goes wrong? You're just not ready because you're not with your God. Spend time with him. Commune with him. Let him speak to you and be ready for every situation of life just as Daniel was. 